So, okay. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and we're here to uh, talk about empathy, and I'm uh, with uh, Peter Bazlajet. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Edwin, you pronounced that brilliantly. Okay. And, uh, well, you're possibly the only person who's got it right first time. Uh, okay. And I'm Peter Bazlajet, delighted to be talking to you, Edwin, and I'm the author of a book called The Empathy Instinct. And I have a copy right here, which I'll I'm, show. I'm so isn't that wonderful? And you, you have the hardback, I have the paperback. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. That, that would make a good picture for the screenshot. And so would you like to say a bit about yourself? You're a, you know, I can just mention that you're a, a British television executive, and it sounded like you had uh, been involved in developing the independent TV production sector in the UK, and uh, you're also uh, the chair of the Arts Council England. I was. So, um, yes, I've been active in media and arts. So I've worked as a TV producer for about a little over 40 years, or at least that's all I'm admitting to. And um, mostly I created entertainment shows. Uh, and I used to help run an international production company called Endemol. They had quite a number of hits on in the, t in the US in the 90s and the noughties. Um, and I currently chair one of our commercial uh, broadcasters here which is called ITV. Um, prior to that recently I was chair of the Arts Council and that's the government body that puts public money into arts and media. So we want to talk about uh, your book uh, The Empathy Instinct, How to Create a More Civil Society and just as, as a set we don't I don't want to just go into you know reviewing everything in the book because one I would suggest everyone get the book on audio tape i just that's how i got it i have a copy here too but i got it on you audio get, you might get slightly fed up with the sound of my voice but yes audio is a good option i put it on my cell phone and when i would take a walk i would listen to it it was great i just tried it it's eight and a half hours of audio of you speak oh, eight and a half hours <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I enjoyed it. So, and then also there's, uh, there'll be links uh, to this. It's on Aud Audible, on, which is on Amazon. And uh, there's also a couple interviews of you. One is on a talk that you did at Google. So there's like a fifth, almost an hour long yes. talk. The talk at Google got slightly um, diverted by a insistent vegetarian questioning me in the audience. So um, that's not altogether, um, uh, it's fine, but it's not, it, it got slightly diverted. Okay, so a little bit of a warning there. <laughs> uh, and then you had uh, another talk uh, on empathic citizens. So there's uh, at the Luminaire Durham 2015, it was a 15 minute talk, and then there was another half hour talk on on YouTube uh, on the arts, culture, and empathy. So there'll be links to those uh, uh, interviews of you. And so I kind of wanted to build on it. I would suggest people go listen to those. And, um, you know, at the core of your book, it, it, it seems like you're saying that you wanted to create, uh, you know, nurture empathic citizens. And, you know, I'm trying to build a culture of empathy. And I think that's what you're sort of saying was, hey, we need to build a more empathic society and the arts are a way of doing that. Is yes, that kind of a core? They're, one, they're one way of doing it, but yes, that's absolutely right. I, um, I, uh, I, 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 I stumbled across the subject. You've been looking at it for many years, Edwin. I stumbled across it when I was thinking about all the reasons we might put public money into arts and culture. And I had this phrase, empathetic citizens, on my mind, and I then had to discover what I meant by that. <laughs> and so I discovered, of course, there was this science of empathy. There was all this work had been done with MRI scanning and working out how the brain works and we're mapping the human brain. I think we're only halfway through that. And so we learn much more about now about how our brains work, why we get on with each other, which has always intrigued everybody for centuries, why we function as society, why we don't function as a society. And then I was interested in what that means for public policy. So what does it mean for the way we um, conduct health care? What does it mean for our criminal justice and, uh, and restorative justice, restorative justice um, uh, uh, proceedings? What does it mean in the digital era, which I think has many challenges to it that we, we never imagined before the internet came along? But what does it mean for how we bring up our small children? And yes, in a pro-social way, why would we put public money into arts and culture 
because essentially it tells human stories. And in the telling of human stories, and this is true of popular culture, everything from movies to opera, it tells human stories and enables us to put ourselves in the shoes of other people. And therefore, it enables us, if you like, to look beyond our own tribe. Yeah, so uh, you, you also had talked about healthcare too. So you looked at different sectors of, this, of the culture and how empathy uh, uh, can support or each of those different sectors. And so you, you, you've sort of laid out in, in these other interviews, you know, sort of the case for it. So what I'm really curious about, your book has been out like what, over two and a half, about two and a half years, is that right? Almost, almost yeah. that, yeah. So it's like, how has it gone for you, this effort to build this more empathic culture? Like how has the book been received? What's been the experience of trying to move the culture, I guess in the UK, to be more empathic? What's, what's been the successes and the failures or the struggles or the challenges you've had? Uh, well, obviously you know, I've been followed everywhere by cheering crowds of millions. My wisdom. Uh, or perhaps a little less than that. Um, look, I think, um, firstly, I think that it struck a considerable chord in the arts and cultural community. Uh, and I think uh, it's not unfair to say people have thought more about why they do what they do. Why do I produce a play? Why do I produce a movie? What is the effect it has on people? What, what is the positive effect uh, that arts and culture can have? So I think within the arts and cultural community, it has had an effect. I think it's had an effect in uh, what I might call uh, policy making and government to a certain extent, because um, with the public funding of arts and culture, which is a bit stronger in the UK than the US, mm -hmm. actually not as weak in the US as people say, the National Endowment for the Arts may have been starved somewhat by the Republicans, but many cities, particularly I'm thinking of New York when Mayor Bloomberg was there, have put a considerable amount of money into local arts and culture, so they see the value of it. But um, I think in the, in the, what you might call the national policy debate of why are we more angry? Why are we in an era of populism? Uh, does the internet change our behavior? I think it's helpful um, to have these discussions. And I think, uh, I, I wouldn't overplay my role, but I think it has resonated that pe a lot of people are concerned uh, about uh, why do we seem to be a little bit more angry, a little bit less sympathetic to other people. And so um, it, this is a way of looking into it. I've also had interest specifically uh, from uh, practitioners of um, uh, law like the probation service uh, and so on and interest specifically from some people in the health community connecting i've been talking to groups of doctors uh, for instance where it's interesting in many areas uh, of the world and particularly the states in the uk they're putting arts and culture into the training for doctors um, because they need to understand stories and enable their patients to tell them their own personal stories and listen to those stories and understand what, what they represent. Um, but listen, I don't want to overplay it. It's mm -hmm. sold uh, gratifyingly a few thousand, uh, several thousand copies. I don't know, seven or eight thousand copies. Um, even a few in the United States, as you have proved by waving it at me, <laughs> gratifyingly. Um, but uh, anyway, so I think I wanted to kick off a debate. I think that I've done it to some extent, probably not as much as I would have liked. Well, there is a, a movement towards empathy, like in, behind me, you know, are books on, you know, empathy and, you know, new ones come out all the time. So there is a, a, a push, you know, uh, an interest in this. And, you know, I'm kind of like, just kind of wanting me to talk, so we could talk about like, you know, where are we now? Like, what can we do sort of next? Like, what are the next steps that we can do? How can we work together to, you know, get the community to work together and, you know, kind of move this value uh, into society more, into the culture, really, you know, have more cultural transformation. Because in a sense, you know, that, yeah, things are, since Barack, you mentioned Barack Obama, you know, saying we need a, you know, Supreme Court justice that has empathy, et cetera, and you know, there's an empathy deficit. You know, things have gotten more contentious, you know, in the United States, at least. I mean, I'm here in Berkeley where the left and right are having knockdown, drag out street fights, you know, I mean, bloody uh, street fights. So, you know, things I don't seem to be going in a ne necessarily in a more empathic direction. It's like, what do we do about this? You know, what are we yeah. going to... 
I, I might I might point to a couple of areas. Um, one is um, what I would call uh, prejudice, and particularly tribal prejudice, or if you like, racism. Um, I was very taken by the Dutch primatologist, who now has lived in America for years, Franz de Waal, who wrote that book, The Age of Empathy, which mm -hmm. you'll have on your shelf yep, behind. I do. And I love that paragraph that I quote in my book of his, we've evolved to hate our enemies, to ignore people we barely know, and to distrust anybody who doesn't look like us. Even if we're largely cooperative within our communities, we become almost a different animal in our treatment of strangers. And he's done a lot of very good thinking about how empathy is both the problem and the solution. How empathy, our natural empathy for those within our own tribes, and that might be people of the same race, color, religion, uh, football supporters. You know, we, we form, we're fluid. We form groups of self-identifying tribes all the time, or our family, or whatever it happens to be. But very often we do identify with people of the same culture and the same color. And so I would say that racism is a natural state of the human, per, human being. In other words, we're bred to it. Now, when I say empathy is the problem as well as the solution, the sort of empathy that enables us to understand other people who appear to be different to us, but are in fact the same, and allows us to reach out of our own tribe and understand them and their feelings, and then identify that their feelings are the same as our feelings, their fears are the same as ours, their needs, their desires are the same as ours. That's quite profound. And I personally think that in all the education about racism in schools, I think it probably is completely ineffective at the moment. Certainly I'm speaking for the UK, because I think we establish racism as some terrible evil that everybody should feel guilty about and, and, and they should, it should never have even have occurred to them. But of course, the point is naturally people will be wary of people who look different or they think are different or are culturally different or have a different religion or a, a different sense of humor or whatever it happens to be. And that is a natural state. That hostility is natural. And only when you understand that, you know, that's natural to us, can you overcome it. And I think to get, you, you, we need to get away from the feeling of guilt Mm -hmm. get a more genuine understanding so that would that would be one thing i'd point to okay so there's it's like uh, so to so be more accepting of that there's differences and not feel guilty about that racism that so well, and, and it applies beyond racism i mean racism is one aspect of it i mean you talk of the trench warfare in the streets of berkeley between the right and the left in america at the moment and i i notice that the Republican Party, or certainly the president, Republican president, is a more extreme version of republicanism than previous Republican presidents. And I note that potential candidates for the Democratic nomination are more uh, apparently, if you take them as a whole, slightly more left-wing than they have been in the past. And therefore, our politics is slightly more at the extremes at the moment. And I think there are lots of interesting reasons for that and lots to do with the credit crunch and so on. But um, how how would you get those people to um, listen to each other mm. and even to accept that they have a different point of view? And in human societies, there have always been people with different points of view. But in the end, those human societies succeed when people cooperate and not necessarily surrender their differences, but somehow accommodate them. Mm. These well, there's are, a, oh, there's a, there's a, sorry, is there more? No, you go on. Okay. There, there's a couple of different things that you brought up. The first one I wanted to go back to was this notion that empathy uh, is creating differences, like you're talking about Franz Duhal. Like, I, dis I disagree with that. I think that you can have, like, in-group uh, empathy, and that if you have out-group, it, it's, it's not that empathy is to blame for the for in-group, out-group. It's that there's it's like other things are the cause of it. So it's the empathy is just a, a connecting with, you know, people within your group that you feel comfortable with, that, you know, you have a sense of uh, awareness and sensitivity to their felt experience and maybe a sense of care, but it's not the empathy itself that is the, the block to the empathy to the outside. It's those blocks to empathy. There's a lot of different blocks to empathy 
and those are actually blocks that can be overcome. Uh, so it's not the empathy itself. It, I mean, I hear, you know, Franz will make that case and others too, that oh, there's this empathy is the cause of in-group, out-group. I don't think it's the cause. I think there's other factors that are blocking it. Just like when you breathe, it's like if you have air constriction because somebody's holding a hand over your mouth, it's not the breathing that's the problem. It's the block of the, you know, somebody holding their hand over your mouth and to identify those blocks and then to overcome those blocks. So it's a, you know, it's a subtle point, but. It, well, it's uh, an interesting point. Uh, it, it, it's quite an esoteric point. Um, if we take two groups of football supporters or, um, you know, uh, whether we're talking soccer or American football or whatever, but two groups of sports supporters, rival teams, who've been known, I don't know how often it happens in the States, but in Europe, they've been known to fight each other. Right. Stand up fights, particularly after a few um, well-chosen pints of liquor. But um, uh, what, 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 are, what are they up to? Um, they have um, a tribalism, a self-identification, a cause, which is the support of their team. They have an empathy, mutual empathy between themselves. Uh, why are they fighting each other? Because they see the others as the opposition. Um, uh, now, is the cause of that, what is the cause of that? The cause of that, you could say, is um, that uh, sport pitches them against each other. Yeah. So there is, um, as it were, um, a provocation. But I would say to you that without their very strongly self-identifying empathy, they wouldn't um, react in the way they do. So the interplay between the two you might argue it's not the cause. I might even agree with you, but I'd say please look closely at the interplay because in the end, there's a smudged line there. Yeah, it's, well, I would say it's about power over in a sense that empathy is about power with. There, it, empathy is an integrative process where I hear you and you hear me and we sort of integrate our ideas. You know, we do that. We do it uh, every week. We have these empathy circles, which are using empathic dialogue between the political left and the political right. It's like one person speaks, they hear and with you know, active listening, reflect back what they hear the other person say, and then vice versa. So it's an integrative uh, procedure or practice. Whereas power over is the competitive approach where I will win, I will dominate, and I will suppress, and I will be the victor. So it's sort of a power over. So you can have power with and power over, but it's the power over, I mean, at the same time, I can have somebody who I'm being empathic with, and then there's gonna be somebody else that I'm trying to dominate, and you can have that going at the same time in your brain. And so I would say it's the power over that is the problem and is the block. It's not the empathy itself. The empathy is an integrative process. So if we get those two teams to say, hey, we're not gonna compete with each other. We're going to, I'm gonna to listen to you, you're going to listen to me, and we're gonna have an integrative, empathically integrative, you know, dialogue. So, I mean, that's... Yeah, well, of course that, um, if you ask two competing football teams in their league to cooperate rather than play each other, that wouldn't go, lead to a very good game of soccer, would it? Um, so, um, yeah, well, possibly. Um, uh, I was going to make another point, but it's gone completely out of my mind. Ask me another question. Oh, so, yeah, so it's, it's the competitive quality that kind of inhibits empathy, I guess I'm saying. If we, if we create a bunch of competitive games you know, we're blocking the empathy because we're trying to win and have power over the other person. So it's not the empathy itself, it's that power over is blocking. Yeah, I, I hear your point, but I think my argument was um, that in the interplay between empathetic identification within a tribe and opposition to another tribe or group or an idea or whatever it happens to be, sport, it might be religion or whatever, there's a smudged line there. I don't think you can quite draw your definitions as clearly as you do. I, I, I see, I see um, a sort of symbiotic interplay. So if you think I've exaggerated, and Franz de Waal exaggerates by saying empathy is the problem as well as the solution, it's part of the problem as well as the solution. Let me put it like, like that. That's, that, would be my, that would be my final offer to you. 
Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I these, want to make another. These, these I want to make another. I want to oh, you have a different point. point. Okay, go for it. Or, uh, well, uh, uh, I was just going to say. Um, I noted in one of your other interviews, you mentioned the book uh, against empathy. Uh -huh. Actually, you can no more be against empathy than you can be against breathing, because empathy is one of the things ways we behave as human beings, uh, as is uh, other instincts. Uh, and it has all sorts of aspects to it, as, we, as we've already discussed. But I do think um, that what that book was picking up on was a legitimate concern that um, some people might deploy conversations about empathy as though it's some sort of Californian hippie philosophy where we should all smoke dope and just smile at people. Um, and empathy really works um, in relation to other things like a sense of reciprocity, a sense of fairness, um, uh, and a sense uh, of common sense too. For instance, if you want to help people who are less fortunate than yourself and you give your entire worldly wealth to the first person you find begging on the street and you yourself become destitute, that would be empathetic, but it would not be commonsensical. So okay. uh, uh -huh. uh, and I, I just wanted to throw out there um, that, you know, that I think empathy is not an end in itself. It, 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 it has this interplay, mm -hmm. as I say, with fairness, reciprocity common sense and other aspects okay so what i'm hearing there is that you're seeing empathy is not a thing in just of itself but there's a it's in relationship with a lot of these other different uh qualities and for example if you're empathizing with people in need and you're not taking care of yourself that you're going to uh you're, you know you're going to harm yourself so in the news today uh from the united states is your president trump getting a bit um tough with the chinese uh, he's doing a bit of saber rattling. Uh, there's a negotiation, trade negotiation going on. Eventually, there'll probably be an agreement, despite all the saber rattling. But one of the things he seems to be uh, wants to ensure is that uh, it, it, he ends up with what he regards as a fair deal for the United States. And um, if he just sort of over over sympathised with uh, the Chinese in what they want, they're basically an exporting country. Uh, uh, sorry, they are an importing country and uh, America is an exporting country, then, um, uh, you know, it wouldn't be good. So, so in, that, if, in that trade negotiation, all sorts of things are at play. Not much empathy, I think, from the president, but uh, in, amongst the negotiators, there will be an element of a recognition of the, what the other side wants, otherwise it isn't a good negotiation. But all those other things like reciprocity, fairness, common sense will, will, will well, be there. You know. What, so what you're sort of what I hear is that if you're like I think in, in one of the in the Google uh, interview someone said hey you know I I don't want to go to the hospital to you know take care of you know visit the friend that's ill and you're and then you say well you know you're talking about you have to take care of yourself as well and so and and I and and, and I agree with that in the sense that you can see empathy from sort of an individualistic point of view, like, oh, I empathize with all these people who are in need. And what I'm interested in is a culture of empathy. So, and I think that's what you're talking about is the reciprocity, right? It's, a, it's not just me empathizing with the world. It's really about a mutual cultural empathy where I am in empathizing with you and you're empathizing with me. And so I think that's what you're meaning maybe by reciprocity is that, it's just not this one, you know, you have to feel guilty if you're not empathizing with everybody in the world. But it's like, uh, it's the same thing with the refugees in, you know, from let's say Syria. You know, it's like you can empathize with them, but they can empathize with you. And really that country needs to have some empathy with each other because that's a huge empathy deficit in that country itself. So seeing the, the whole culture and the level of empathy within the culture I think is is important as well as maybe the concept or of self empathy that you have to empathize with what your own needs are, and that that's important too in in the relationship. Yes, and what you've just described is multi layered, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's a whole culture because if we look at because and I, I from what I've seen in in the writings and talks about empathy, it's all. It's often seen in sort of this individualistic, you know, you as an individual have to empathize or, or, or not, but not seeing all of the relationships and how do we increase the, 
the level of empathy in the culture, like seeing it, you know, from a group of a community and how do we raise, you know, everybody's empathy with each other and within the culture. Yes, it's interesting that communities that have had to cooperate, and they would people always give the example of Dutch communities. Um, if you have you visited Holland? I have. Uh huh. Yeah. So they have a more cooperative society, I would argue, than many others I've visited, um, and a more cooperative politics actually. Although they now have their own populist right wing, uh, anti-immigrant party who want to leave the EU. Um, as most countries do. On the whole, they've had coalition governments between a number of parties, which is a, an effective, as it were, cooperation. But they say that the culture of cooperation in Holland comes from the fact that communities that didn't cooperate drowned. Mm -hmm. because, oh, uh, uh -huh. because everybody had to work together to build the dikes, to drain the land and keep the sea back uh, in the flat part of Holland next to the coast. And um, I, I, that's sort of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's the importance of empathy towards cooperation. If you want to be able to cooperate, you need to listen and dialogue with each other and work through problems and issues. So it's... And it's central. like it's like a necessity taught them a general culture of cooperation, I, I would argue. Mm -hmm. The environment. So the, the need for not drowning, having the sea come over and flood your land requires you to yeah now i wanted to ask you your views about whether the internet era has presented us with new challenges in society that we didn't previously have um may i just give a couple of examples sure and then uh -huh. you 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 um because um it seems to me i i know we are now communicating with each other on the device of the internet and we see each other and and we're essentially having an empathetic communication because i can see your face if i said something pretty hostile now i think i would see it register on your face mm, right and I, yes exactly and i would understand that i'd said something and i would be if i wasn't um, autistic or um uh, uh, you know somebody on the spectrum i would be able to read your face and understand that you were offended um but much of the internet communication is not as we are now face to face and um, elements of the internet era um, a lot of communication is now textual which is commu massive communication without facial um, uh, face to face um, uh, sight um, I know we used to write letters in the old days but th th this is uh, textual communication on the internet is ubiquitous and um, um, uh, in bulk, you know, uh, massive. Massive, more, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, like we're online three, four hours a day or whatever. Secondly, it's instant. So we tend to send things the moment we think about them and, and they go off immediately. We don't stop and think about them. Um, there's this question of the echo chamber effect where people with, if you take the general view of I'd say, I'd say people with extreme views. Let's say people who think Elvis is still alive or people who think um, uh, the moon landings were faked or indeed people who are anti-vaccine because it causes autism. Not all of these I would call relatively extreme views um, because they're held whether honestly or dishonestly by a minority. But those people with those extreme views can now find each other. They can form mutual support groups, and that's the sort of echo chamber effect. Uh, and then um, because it is so, um, if you like, democratic, um, there are fewer filters. So in the past, when we communicated with each other, writing articles in newspapers, uh, giving interviews on TV or other media on the radio, it was all um, curated. So much of the opinion expression in society was curated editorially. And it tended to take the extremes away. Um, and not completely, but to some extent. But and now it's possible for me to set up any channel I want online to anybody and express as, as such extreme views as I like. And finally, um, um, I, 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 I've got a phrase I've written down for a talk I'm giving next week. I've written down white lies are empathetic. Um, and that is that a lot of... Um, 
what I would call good manners depend on us not saying the first thing that comes into our head. And I, I think on the internet we tend to do that. Uh, so that I don't say to somebody they're looking rough today or they're wearing horrible clothes, although I may genuinely believe that because it's unempathetic and it's unpleasant and it's offensive and it doesn't help us get along with each other or cooperate or do bigger things or more important things like work with each other effectively or whatever we happen to be uh, gathering to do. And so is for judgmental. All those, <laughs> sorry? And is judgmental. Yes, but of course it's, we are judgmental, you know, we, we are critical creatures. Uh, the question is how, not, not to stop judging, but to analyse our judgmental uh, attitudes, uh, of course. Are they fair? Are they honest? But, and then can we ca take care with how we express them. But um, for all those reasons, it seems to me the internet era is giving us new challenges. Um, along with that, I'd, I'd, I'd probably add um, uh, the um, prevalence of uh, extreme porn on uh, mobile devices, uh, smartphones, to um, you know, 12, 11, 12 year old kids and so on. So for all those reasons, um, I'm intrigued about how we going forward, and we're only 15 years into the internet era, so why would we understand much about it or know much about it? It's new to us. It's new, a new challenge to society as well as a great benefit to society, obviously. Um, how are we going to deal with that now? Is that something you've thought about? You have used yeah, in a sense. In a sense, what I'm hearing is we have this new technology and there's these blocks to empathy within the technology and how do we sort of overcome those empathy blocks? Did we lose you? Uh oh. Oh, there you are. We just had it froze a little bit. We're we're still able can, to connect. Can, can, can you edit that? Uh, it's I can't, but it'll it'll be okay. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> We're just little blocks here and there, but it's still working. I think. Would you, would you mind starting your, your <laughs> response again? Because I lost. Oh, yeah. It. So what I was hearing, I was just sort of reflecting what I heard you say, and the essence was is the technology is uh, this new technology, internet technology. There's a lot of blocks to empathy from this, and so like, how do we overcome those blocks? It, it's kind of the essence, and I would say I I, I agree that uh, like text. I just hate you know using text for you know, detail, you know, working through complex uh, issues. But I really love this video conferencing. So every week we do what we call an empathy circle with the political left and right. And we bring people from the right and the left to talk about difficult topics. For example, this Saturday, we'll be doing one on pro-life and pro-choice. And we've done that before and, you know, it gets heated. And, but with the video conferencing, you can see, you know, I can, you can see the others and you can, you can read the, the feelings, and, you know, better. And, you know, people are a bit more civil as well as we have, uh, in terms of, you know, you were really making the case for uh, the arts being one means uh, for, you know, fostering empathy, which, you know, I, I totally agree with. Uh, the approach that I've used, been building on, is on the act of listening. You know, it comes out of like the work of Carl Rogers and the therapeutic world, where uh, in these empathy circles, one person speaks and they select someone to speak to, and that person reflects back their understanding of the speaker until the speaker feels fully heard and understood. And then once they feel understood, it's the listener's turn to select someone and then that person reflects back. So it's a structured dialogue, and we have these recorded, you know, we record these. And so I find these immensely, you know, helpful, and that's the internet, that we're able to talk with people all over the country, bring them together. So in that sense, it really sort of helps foster empathy and connection. But in terms of text, uh, you know, people getting into their bubbles, and in a sense, we're trying to create a structure to get people out of their bubbles, right? We're trying to have them yeah. dialogue across their bubbles. And it's very interesting what you say there, because, of course, um, the Anglo-Saxon political model and justice system, invented, I think, largely by men, I have to say, um, is gladiatorial. It's yeah. um, opposition, black and white. Uh, it's how... Um, we're divided apart. It's interesting that um, 
there are legal systems in the world that aren't like that, that are just have investigating magistrates rather than lawyers who will argue the case for and, law and against. And the whole debating culture, which I myself have taken part in when I was younger, I said I once was debating down the road from you at Berkeley University mm -hmm. uh, uh, many years ago, um, actually during the presidential campaign of Ford and Carter in 76. Um, but uh, you're talking about something so different, uh, culturally different. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, have you thought about and explored whether that is something that would be a beneficial system for the law, uh, for the courts, and for Congress? I, I have, absolutely. I think we need a total empathic cultural transformation of the whole society. And that's why I'm excited about your book, because you kind of lay out you know, different areas. Like you talked about the justice system. How do you bring more of a restorative practice in there? I was just at a town hall with two congressional representatives uh, from our districts here, uh, Barbara Lee and Mark DeSalnier and they were having a town hall on race. And uh, they, they took my question as the last question. And the question was, would you be willing to take part in an empathy circle with Republican representatives? And they both said yes. So I am trying to get the congressional representatives to have an empathy circle, you know, sort of a mediated empathy circle around race. And I mean, we could we could get your uh, MPs to do the same thing, so that the leadership models constructive dialogue instead of this debate. Yeah. So here's the thing: you see, here in the UK at the moment, in the United Kingdom, um, as you will have read in the newspapers um, or seen on television, we have this polarizing issue about whether we should be in the European Union or not, and everybody's lining themselves up. I When there was a referendum on it, perhaps unwisely, but anyway, there was, it divided the country 50-50. And it was like families were divided and uh, age groups were divided and people were divided by wealth and by geography. And it, it opened up all sorts of divisions in society that were probably latent, but not explicit. And at the moment, the two main political parties who sort of, if you were a Martian looking down from another planet, you'd say, you guys agree with each other. But because of their own tribal loyalties to their party, because they both like to be in power, they're finding it almost impossible to come up with a common um, uh, platform. And we need a common platform because at the moment we're floundering as a country because we haven't decided how we're going to go forward, whether we're going to leave, how we're going to leave, on what terms we're going to leave. It's making us look ridiculous to the rest of the world. And it's confusing and depressing us as well. But they can't show the leadership and the cooperation when really, genuinely, if you were, if you were a completely dispassionate outsider, you'd say, you guys agree with each other. What's going on? So, my God, I, I look forward to your new system. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. Uh, it would be. Oh, I think it's frozen. We're... Oh, wait a second. Hopefully we'll get you back. Yeah, we're having a little bit of freezing periodically. I think you're, you're back. But yeah, so you're, you're, you're hopeful about, you'd like to see this new system. We could work on it. You probably know some MPs and we could hold an empathy circle with some of them to model constructive dialogues. I think that's while the arts are you know, great for conveying empathy, it t t taps into the felt experience, it seems like we need more sort of relational uh, skill building. Like how do we have constructive dialogue and you know, the, the tools that come out of mediation, that come out of the therapeutic, you know, you know, constructive listening, empathic listening. I think these are like tools, it seems to me, should be, like taught to everyone from the get-go, you know, from the, from high, you know, from grammar school on. Like I have nephews and nieces that are like five and six, seven years old, and they fight and they're beating each other up. And then I've been starting to teach them how to do an empathy circle. You know, and first I listen to one, then I listen to the other. And, you know, I don't tell anybody that they're right or wrong. I just listen. And then I try to get them to listen to each other. And I, 
to the point now when they fight, I say, oh, we have a conflict, what do we do? And they say, oh, we have an empathy circle. And, and this is like five-year-old, <laughs> come on, five-year-old little niece, Annie, you know, she's five-year-old. And then afterwards, she says, I like empathy circles, let's do it again. <laughs> you know? so, so it's like even little kids can appreciate and, you know, take on the, these uh, skills. And so I think that's sort of what's missing from- Well, well of course, we, we, we know how, how children develop, um, you know, from um, emotional contagion is the first thing, you know, the steps of empathy, which you, 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 you know, I've written about and other people uh -huh. have written about better than me. Um, so, I mean, it, this is... Uh, you just broke up there again. I think, I think you're I'm back. back. You're, yeah, I'm back. You're back. So yeah, you're, you're, you're saying that, yeah, you're one, of your, one of the chapters of your book is about child development, the importance of empathy in child development. And yeah, I think that's what you're pointing out. Yes, I mean, we have this tragic um, statistic, which I think is comparable with uh, the United States, of the number of people in prisons who were in care as children, who were in, I don't know, do you use that phrase in the US, in care? Um, children, children are not brought up by their parents uh -huh, like in adopted family. or uh, well, well not even adopted you know okay. they're in the care of the authorities uh, or the social services uh, uh -huh. because their families have broken up or they've had to be taken away from an abusive situation or whatever it is um one in four of the people in a british prison was in care as a child i mean think about that oh my god one in four wow yeah well that's really, yeah well that's sort of addressing this how do we build a more empathic culture and it's like every aspect of our culture needs to be needs to be addressed you know the to be sure that every child has that empathic support that you know growing up and that that you know you talk about the healthcare that the you know the doctors have this empathic presence but also that they get the support they need you know they're needing empathic support because there's huge uh you know suicide, you know, drug addiction, whatever, within, you know, the medical field as well. So they're needing support. Then you're talking about the justice system, you know, needs sort of a redesign. And so, you know, it's a pretty big task. And, you know, I guess, what, where, where do you see your work going next in terms of, you know, affecting the culture? You've, you've got the book out, you're talking about it, you're doing interviews. You know, how do you see this sort of going forward, you know, bringing this out into, besides getting the MPs to do empathy circles. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, are per, you are personally volunteering to sort out the British political system. I hope you understand that. <laughs> you and me both. Well, we'll see you about five. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, uh, I wrote the book because it came out of my interest initially, uh, 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 the arts and funding of the arts and, and the pro-social aspects. And one other thing that I mentioned in the book that I haven't mentioned to you today, which was um, asked, I was asked by the government to help lead a, a movement to design a new Holocaust memorial in London. And I met an awful lot of the survivors who live in uh, the UK from the Holocaust in the mid 20th century and um, talking to them about what happened when a society abandoned empathy for at least one a minority who lived there uh, which has obviously been seen before yes that that was the, the background in terms of going forward well um I, I don't know about you but i have a day job you know <laughs> so i you know i chair a tv company i i, I and uh, actually i think the work of a television drama and news and all these other things is part of the empathy process. So I feel I've been working in the business of empathy all my life. I just didn't realize it. Um, secondly, um, I, um, I do work on policy for the government to further what we call the creative industries, which is a, an industrial sector we've defined. I think you may have it in the US as well, um, which involves film, radio, video games, and so on. So, um, I feel that the, the more the creative industries prosper and the more content is um, nurtured, the more we have the, if you like, the conduit for, for empathy. Um, and then um, I happily support and give talks. So I'm, on next week, I'm going to give a talk in a place called Winchester, which is an ancient city in the south of uh, Britain, um, 
to a group of people who formed an educational empathy movement. And they have um, uh, both teachers in schools who are using empathy, empathy techniques, um, empathetic books and so on in schools as a, as a sort of explicit rather than implicit activity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're That's also- The Empathy Lab? The Empathy Lab? Is that the organization? No, I think the Empathy Lab is, uh, that's a separate one actually, okay. that's uh, at Oxford University. Uh, but he, yes, he, I have been in contact with him, certainly we did a, 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 a conference together. Um, and they're also involving librarians in that because they see books as a very important aspect of, of this. So I'm doing various things, but I sort of have a day job as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, it takes time, sure. Well, um, we, we do these uh, empathy circles, if you like to take part in one. I'm starting to bring together, you know, authors uh, who have, um, you know, written about empathy or, or, you know, working, you know, quite intensely on the topic. So we bring four people together and we do an empathy circle on a topic. So they go for two hours. Uh, we use the empathic listening. In fact, there's one coming up right after this uh, uh, interview and it's on sort of our definitions of empathy what are we meaning by uh, empathy so you're welcome to you know take part in one of those it's a way of you know meeting uh, other people in, in the field so you're would like to invite you to take part in one of those as well yep oh, we're frozen again <laughs> Okay, so we've had a bit of glitches as we've gone along. The, the video is periodically uh, freezing, so we apologize for that. And um, hope we can continue the, the dialogue, uh, you know, perhaps take part in, a mutual, in an empathy circle. I don't know how much of that you heard. Uh, Thank you, and yeah, no, I did hear it. And um, would you kindly send me a link to your next, or, or an empathy circle I could watch? I'd love okay, to watch. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, I definitely will. And uh, well, it's it's been uh, great, you know, talking to you. I don't know if there's anything sort of to wrap up, uh, uh, any final sort of comments or I could talk for hours. Yes, <laughs> I love course. this topic. I love exploring it. I love seeing, you know, what are the steps we can we can do. And uh, so I really appreciate, you know, you're taking the time to chat about this. And with I'm, I, I'm, I'm uh, immensely uh, pleased to have talked to you and listened to your very interesting ideas and perceptions yourself. And your dedication to the subject is exciting and admirable. Um, uh, I suppose if I had one closing thought, it would be that I hope very much that the scientific drive to map the human brain which is only sort of half done in terms of the different parts of the brain, what function they have, how they function, why they function, why they don't function. The extraordinary diversity of human beings, human emotions, human abilities to communicate, not communicate, will teach us so much more about how to get on better. Um, you know, I love the fact that mildly or heavily autistic people who can't recognize facial uh, emotions on others can be taught to do it if you spend six months training their brain. Um, and um, so I hope all that scientific work, which I'm not party to, uh, with the um, fantastic uh, um, device, the fRMI scanner, I hope all that work goes on and all that academic work that's going on, because all the time we are finding more about ourselves as a species. Mm -hmm. So, that so would you have fun. real hope in the scientific understanding of the brain, things like mirror neurons and-, and I do. You know, just the, yeah. I, do. Uh -huh. okay. I think that, um, you know, as we understand the operation of the different parts of the brain, uh, how you can build, how you, you know how people can recover from post-traumatic stress how you, you can you can actually how plastic the brain is we thought we used to think it wasn't but now we know it is all of those things give give us hope about how we can work on uh, improving the way we get on so there we are
Okay, well, great. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, real pleasure. I appreciate your humor. You really had me laughing there at some point. Really appreciate that British humor. And uh, it's a real delight uh, talking to you. I hope we can uh, stay connected and maybe we'll do an empathy circle with some other authors at some point. Thank you very much, Edwin. Lovely talking to you. Okay, Peter. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.